Good morning. Uh, welcome to this Sunday. This is a Sunday, of course, where we will have Thanksgiving-themed uh, worship, singing. We've got bell choir with us doing their... Uh, this is a traditional piece that you do, right? And this is, as I, I'm trying to remember, prior years and where we were with the pandemic and so forth, but we've got you back in full force and we appreciate it. The choir, of course, Chancel Choir will be singing as well. And uh, the hymns will be built around Thanksgiving themes. Now the scripture today is dealing with the life of a woman named Priscilla in the early church. So that will be a little bit of an independent Bible teaching within the Thanksgiving theme. We're glad that you're here. I want to welcome folks who are joining us online. We know you're with us. I ask us all to maybe greet one another here and make sure we wave over the organ area where folks are tuned in with that camera. We're glad that everyone is gathered, gathered together to ask the Lord's blessing. How about that? Uh, church school following worship will wrestle with the scripture, a story of Priscilla up in the fireside room. We can thank Evelyn Williams for refreshments today. She was in early uh, hustling with refreshments out there. Or have a few after worship. Flowers are from Denise and Jim Weirman. I'm grateful for their generosity. And uh, I'll draw your attention to the bulletin around this week's activities. Now, of course, the bell choir and the chancel choir are ordinarily on Thursday evenings, but not this Thursday evening because of it being Thanksgiving. The women's Bible study is meeting on Monday at 1 p.m. Oh, you're here at the... Where did, I'm looking in the bell section, not the... Okay, Roberta's over there. She's a part of it with Ruth and other folks. Uh, you're going to begin the study of the book of James. Ooh, all right. Okay, that's tomorrow at 1 here. Okay. I'm trying to work through some notes. The United Women in Faith group will meet briefly following worship service. You're going to just do as you usually do, which is sort of a huddle in the back of the sanctuary, right? Okay, some decisions to make about where to direct some funds for mission and how to help some folks with the good fundraising that group has done. Uh, this just handed me, well, a few minutes ago, by Sharon, Sharon Harnden. You, as you can see in the north parking lot near the drive, one of the Feed the Hungry stickered cars, if you would like to donate to, this is Feed the Hungry, this cause, please feel free to do so. See Sharon, and she will make sure the donations go to see Wimberley's Feed the Hungry campaign. So thanks, folks. That was kicked off Wednesday. I have to keep my days straight. So that's a, a citywide project that a lot of us are working on. And Sharon reminds us, if you haven't scheduled a time for your photos for the new church directory, on November 27th, 28th, please sign up today. Table outside in the narthex. Uh, time is running out, folks. If you don't sign up today, you will more than likely be receiving a call in the next few days. There are still time slots available, and you can also still sign up online. And again, thank you. Um, I, I, I won't wise crack about it. I, I use a little good humor if I can sometimes, but we really want folks to do this. Um, folks who have been with us just a little bit, folks who have been with us for a year, folks who have been with us for several months, longtime members, it's for all of us because this will help us get to know each other. So please consider this Pastor Chris's lay down the law, he's serious about this one, we better do it, announcement. Thanks. How's that? Help? Okay. Um, cookie Walk, Christmas decor sale. The event is on Saturday, December 2nd, 10 to 4. 
sign, okay, make sure I get this right. The sign-up sheet for donations, homemade cookies and candies, it's on a round, we call it a card table, but it's a round table with greeting cards on it in the narthex. So we need to have the contributions, the goodies, here at the church no later than, it's Friday, December 1st, 2 p.m. So please put your name on a container. And any questions? Darlene Trussell is handling that project. Okay. Oh, my goodness. Action Food Pantry. Um, this week, some folks drove to Benton Harbor and uh, brought in some more food supplies of turkeys. So we thought, I can't remember, our math was a little off the top of our heads, but more than 90 turkeys. I can't remember how many. Uh-oh, here we go. 96 turkeys, okay. And we had yesterday morning at the Main Street building um, 98 families, which usually translates into between, I'm guessing here, 250, 300 people or so. And it was busy, folks. Now, our generous inclination at this congregation is to make sure people know it's not just the Methodists doing this, right? It's a community-wide ministry. However, however, the folks who brought in most of that food were members of our church, hustled, went and got it. Of course, the folks living next door who do so much work for that ministry and others are part of members of our church. And yesterday morning at 9.40 a.m. when we had a big prayer circle before we started, I counted 24 people in that room, volunteers ready to go. 14 of them were from this congregation. So I'm, I'm not going to hide that. So you are to be commended, and I appreciate all of your hustle. So thank you very much. Big, big day of ministry yesterday. Uh, the next potluck will be next week, the 26th. We've shifted that, and then following the potluck on the 26th, we'll do some decorating of the church for Advent. The 26th is the last Sunday of the Christian year, and then we start all over again with Advent on December 3rd. Okay? And I'm going to share, finally, quickly, uh, we had our annual church congregation meeting last Monday the 13th. This is called a church conference. It is organized through the United Methodist Church in Michigan, the Michigan Conference, the big conference. And uh, Reverend Dwayne Bagley, the district superintendent, came down and he sort of, uh, you know, led us through that meeting representing the bishop. We had a good meeting and lasted just about an hour, maybe a few minutes more. The thing that I took away from that evening in addition to things we just have to do, some motions and some financial decisions, I took away a lot of gratitude last Monday night. Um, it was an opportunity for us to begin to thank some folks who really do so much in our congregation and beyond, and I heard a lot of gratitude from people. So, uh, good meeting. I want to say something about what is called ministry shares. Ministry shares are a commitment every United Methodist congregation has to contribute to the overall budget of the Michigan area United Methodist Church. We used to call them apportionments, but someone wanted to change the name to ministry shares. Every congregation is asked to give a specific amount around Michigan to help. What does it go toward? Well. In general, a lot of it goes toward Michigan ministries. It helps to staff some of our offices in Lansing, Michigan. Uh, educational resources. It helps a number of missional things. This is in addition to what you give to UMCOR, U-M-C-O-R for Ukraine and those things. That's, that's an above and beyond that we do well. 
but the ministry shares have a sort of basic support for the organizational structure. This means when you give to the United Methodist Committee on Relief, if you give $10, $10 goes to the cause. There's a, the structure, the personnel already funded. You don't give to UNCOR $10 and find out later that $6 of it went to pay for somebody's salary and staff. That, no. Because we have a system called ministry shares, all of that structure is already paid for. Got it? Now, this congregation has an annual budget of about $170,000. Uh, it's no secret, I'm trying to just get information out there. Of that, right now about $15,000, $15,000 is earmarked, set aside for this ministry shares up to the annual conference, okay? When I came to be your pastor four and a half years ago, the asking for the Dwajak Church was a little over $18,000 a year. The ministry shares asking has gone down. It's gone down. And, and there are reasons for that. We have changes in the United Methodist Church. We've had some staffing reductions. It, it, the folks in Lansing who are part of the denomination are being responsible, and they're asking a little less from each church, not more. The second thing I'm going to say is this. Ministry shares are not a head tax. Sorry to use that blunt language. We don't take the membership numbers of a congregation and then assign a so-called tax per head. It's a more complicated, generous formula for determining how the number is asked. Okay? This means that churches can focus on membership as a spiritual commitment and not as a number upon which they will be taxed. If anyone suggests to you that someone is on the membership rolls and that somehow is a burden to us, that is incorrect information. People are not burdens. And the last thing that I'll say is this. In recent years, there have been problems in the United Methodist Church. And individual churches have not always been able to give 100% of the asking. You with me? Churches that are asked to give, say, $15,000, somehow only end up giving $5,000 or $10,000 over the course of the year. There are reasons for that. This church has some financial difficulties some years ago and was unable to give 100%. But for the last several years, this church has given 100% every year. You with me? All right. There's something to be, yeah. Come on now. I'm serious. 100% of an asking that has actually gone down a little bit and is being used well. Now, Monday night, the district superintendent shared with us that of all the United Methodist Churches in Michigan, only 35% give 100% of their asking. 35%. That makes me sad. It's a sign of some struggles. But I want you to know that you are one of the 35% who are now and for several years have contributed 100%. Do you understand? That's who you are. So take some sense of appropriate pride in that, please. Thanks for letting me go on a minute. I'll turn things over to Patty. Please stand and join me in the call to worship. We will be reading this responsively. 
O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into God's presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. We are the people of his pasture and the sheep of God's hand. Let us worship God. Please remain standing for the opening hymn, We Gather Together, number 131. We will be singing all three verses. Please be seated and join me in the prayer of confession. We'll be reading this in unison. O oh God, forgive my fallen countenance and my soul grown dreary, as if I did not live in the mystery of thy salvation. Thou hast given so much to me. Give one thing more. A grateful heart, not thankful when it pleases me, as if thy blessings had spare days, but such a heart whose pulse may be thy praise. Hear the good news. Christ died for us before we were grateful for anything that proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Now the bell choir has some special music for us. They will be playing Come Ye Thankful People Come, along with Scott Rumley on the organ.
Our first reading is Ecclesiastes verses 9 through 11. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up the other. But woe to one who is alone and falls and does not have another to help. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Our second reading is Acts 18, verses 1 through 4 and 24 through 28. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he found a Jew named Aquila from Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them, and they worked together. By trade, they were tent makers. Every Sabbath, he would argue in the synagogue and would try to convince Jews and Greeks. Now there came to Ephesus a Jew named Apollos from Alexandria. He was an eloquent man, well-versed in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with burning enthusiasm and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained the way of God to him more accurately. And when he wished to cross over to Achaia, the brothers and sisters encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. On his arrival, he greatly helped those who through grace had become believers, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Messiah is Jesus. Now the chancel choir will be singing, We Come to Say Thank You.
Please stand for the reading of the gospel. <clears throat> Matthew 6, verse 7. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over all the unclean spirits. This is the word of God for the people of God. Please be seated. Before I uh, pray, I want to stand in the theme of the day and thank our music ministry and all of the folks involved in it for hustling so much. That was something, huh? The bells and organ and piano and choir. And, and I know some folks were going back and forth. Uh, of course, Scott and Linda so ably leading us and Camille with the bell. Anyway, thank. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Let's pray. Holy Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of my hearts, all of our hearts, be acceptable unto you, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. This weekend is the anniversary of many things. It's also the anniversary of a very important event in American Christian history that you may never have heard about. In 1973, 50 years ago this weekend, a group of, quote, young, end quote, Christian leaders gathered at a YMCA on Wabash Street in Chicago. It's one of the classic old downtown YMCA buildings uh, that is still standing, used for a little different purpose, I believe, these days. But in 1973, a group of folks who were <coughs> very late 20s, early 30s, some of them were younger pastors, some of them were people who just got their doctoral degrees and were teaching Bible or theology or church history at some of America's seminaries. They gathered at this YMCA for a workshop of meetings and a way to express their Christian commitment. And they issued what was called the Chicago Declaration of Evangelical Social Concern. These were young folks who had grown up in what was known as evangelical Christian churches in America. The word evangelical means good news, reliance upon the gospel of grace, and a trust of the Holy Scriptures to guide us in understanding grace and living that out on a daily basis. That's a very general sort of street level definition. The word evangelical does not mean what people think it means today and what they write about in ill-informed newspaper articles in 2023 in America. So keep that in mind. These were evangelical young folk who trusted the scriptures to guide them in the grace and faithful living of Lord Jesus Christ. And they gathered in Chicago... Bear in mind, uh, these folks would be in their 70s and perhaps a little older today. Uh, I've known a few of them 
and sadly, some have passed into the Lord's kingdom. But they issued this statement. These were the thinkers of what was called the Jesus movement. Ah, now maybe that makes a little more sense. The Jesus movement from the 1960s of primarily young people and into the 1970s who, who knew there was more to the faith than simply keeping rules in church and, and knew there was more to faith than what was being offered by the society at large and were drawn into a revolutionary, if you will, movement. I call myself a little brother of the Jesus movement. I'm just young enough that I wasn't there in the early days. But I learned so much from my older sisters and brothers and was taken up in it uh, along with some others, including Liz, I'll say, and she can talk about that herself sometime in the later 1970s. 50 years ago today. So what did they say? They said a lot of things. Basically, what they said is, hey, folks, Bible-believing Christians, people who believe in salvation by grace through faith and then faithful living, hey, folks, we need to be honest with ourselves. We haven't always treated one another and others fairly. And so this was a statement that dealt with with the concern for folks who are hungry, folks without power in the world, what Jesus has to teach us about that. This is a social action statement by evangelical Christians. I'm going to own it. This is my conviction that so much that passes for so-called evangelical Christianity today is not evangelical Christianity. And so one of the statements here deals with the dignity of women, fitting with our study. Quote, we acknowledge that we, evangelical Christian people up to that point, have encouraged men to prideful dominion and women to irresponsible passivity. So we call both men and William, women excuse me, to mutual submission and active discipleship. We acknowledge that we have encouraged men to prideful dominion and women to irresponsible passivity. So we call both men and women to mutual submission and active discipleship. This phrase, mutual Submission, which comes out of some of Paul's letters, or at least one in, in particular, is a way to look at the relationship between men and women, not from the standpoint of male superiority, and not from the standpoint of individual competition, but a mutual giving of themselves to one another. In marriage, of course, but also in friendship and other roles in human life. Today, we study a prime example from the scripture of mutual submission. Patty read about Priscilla and Aquila. These were early Christians, friends of Paul, and they have together a powerful ministry. And so it's difficult for me to preach about the meaning of Priscilla and her life without including Aquila. But I don't preach about them together as if somehow Aquila needs to be linked, or excuse me, Priscilla needs to be linked to Aquila to have value because that's not the case. Priscilla, in her own right, of her own dignity, of her own created and redeemed stature, was probably the most prominent person in this partnership. And yet it's tough to think of Priscilla without thinking of Aquila. Interesting. In chapter 18 of the Acts of the Apostles, Priscilla and Aquila are mentioned as people who had come 
down to Greece, over and down from Italy. It's thought that they were probably driven out of Italy by the anti-Semitism of the Roman government there. And so they were now in Corinth in Greece, and there they met Paul. Now the three of them were tent makers. Did you see that? It's not uncommon for people to refer to Paul as a tent maker, meaning someone who made fabric and, and leather-related goods for covering and protection and that sort of thing. And we often say someone has a tent maker ministry today as, as a way of describing that perhaps someone is a missionary or preaches on Sunday or serves uh, as a leader in the Christian church while also having a different job. That's the way Paul lived. He was a tent maker who loved Jesus Christ and shared the gospel. It would seem that Priscilla and Aquila were also tent makers. How about that? And so the three became friends and a sort of team. And Priscilla and Aquila gained a kind of trust and a kind of respect in the early Christian community in Greece. Later, in the same chapter, it describes Priscilla and Aquila in Ephesus, which is over across the Aegean Sea into Asia Minor or Turkey. There's a lot of going back and forth here, folks, between what we would call Turkey and Greece today. And in the later verses of chapter 18, Priscilla and Aquila meet Apollos. Apollos, interesting fellow. Someone who becomes a compatriot of Paul and maybe a little bit of a rival as they work out their differences and the different communities try to figure out what Paul says to them and what Apollos says to them and this sort of thing. Uh, but in these early days, this fellow Apollos in Ephesus, Turkey, Asia Minor, is sharing the gospel when he meets Priscilla and Aquila. Now, in my mind, the language of the Greek text is a triumph of diplomatic language when it talks about this guy, Apollos, because it describes him as a devoted follower of Christ, a wonderful person, if you will, my language, who shares the gospel with depth and insight, and it's very complimentary. And then there's a, a, just a, a little tag, but he really didn't know the baptism of Jesus Christ because he came out of this tradition of John the Baptist baptism. So there's, there's a little bit of a hint that he's, he, he is really gifted, and his heart is really in the right place. But he just needs a little more education. Enter Priscilla and Aquila. They support Apollos in Ephesus, and then they take him aside and fill him in on the rest of the gospel, so to speak. Did you get that vibe? And so Priscilla and Aquila, this dynamic duo, this team, exercise their teaching authority with Apollos. And so something happens in this text that I had forgotten about, that I hadn't considered with any depth really until I read it back through this last time and studied, and that is this is a text about the dignity of teaching and learning. Because Priscilla, probably the one who had the greatest stature of the two, the one who might have had a kind of education for her day that allowed her to have that insight and in teaching, is with her husband Aquila, and they take this fellow Apollos aside and sort of 
instruct him in the finer things of Christianity. How did they do it? Did they stand up when Paul was, or excuse me, when Apollos was teaching and say, uh, it's pretty good, but you really don't have the whole story here. Did they do that? No. Did they listen to him with a kind of metaphorical arms crossed? This joker doesn't know the whole thing. No. They appreciated what he brought to the movement and his heart and his initial learning and then afterwards in privacy they got with him and helped him come up to speed. You with me? That's good teaching. That's good teaching. The relationship of Priscilla and Aquila, I'll say these three things, was not a story of male dominance. It was not a story of female individualism in a, in a sort of um, not wanting to be related way. It was a story of mutual submission. And it was together a story of teaching. And so what I take from this are these three things. Good teaching is not an opportunity to lord superior knowledge over others. Good teaching is not an opportunity or does not take place, let's say, when people lord their superior knowledge over others. Now, I'm sure none of us have been in that situation of learning when someone has lorded their superior intellect and knowledge over us. Okay. Number two, Good teaching is not simply a transmission of knowledge. Good teaching is not simply taking the stuff and shoving it into someone else's head. Okay? It's not just transmission of knowledge. Third, good teaching awakens the dignity of learning and the dignity of the learner. You with me? Good teaching awakens the dignity of learning and the dignity of the learner. You show me someone claiming to be a teacher belittling, lording over, reminding a student of how little she or he knows or can do. And I'll show you a student who's not going to learn anything. And so I wanted to end the time of preaching today with this beautiful example from my past about the time a teacher came in and affirmed me and brought me aside and helped me with my own sense of dignity and learning and my own dignity. And I have to be honest, I don't have many examples in my life of that. I do in some ways, but I was tempted to end by sharing the times when someone ridiculed me as a student in public. But I don't want to stay there or be stuck there, right? And what I've concluded, folks, is that it's up to us to build on those moments in our history when maybe someone did take us aside in a loving way and help us learn with dignity. And I had some moments like that. But most especially, it's up to us to go out there and be the people who are teachers of those who need some help and to do so that honors their dignity. Follow? 
Be the good example you may or may not have had in your life. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Be Priscilla and Aquila. All right? So we have a job to do. And maybe you're doing it already, and if so, I want to encourage you and appreciate you. Be the person of composure and confidence who knows your own worth in the presence of a loving God and then share your insight and your expertise with others in a way that awakens their dignity. And we can do that on a daily basis, folks, whether we're in a classroom or not. Amen? Amen. Amen. Please stand for the hymn of response. Now thank we all our God, number 102 in your hymnal, and we'll be singing all three verses. I'd like to share some of our uh, prayer concerns, folks that uh, have maybe had some struggle this week. We know there are many more and certainly don't want to miss people. But in the season of thanks for all of the good, let's remember uh, those who are having a rough time. Uh, let's keep Frank and Fran Skibby in prayer. Um, Fran is not feeling the greatest, and they have had a struggle this week with COVID. They are doing better relative to the COVID. But let's be aware that COVID is out there, and I have known several people who have been ill recently, so this is not over, and we want to be aware of the need and folks who have that struggle. Dorothy Frost's daughter 
has been in the hospital with a, a blockage, an arterial blockage. She's home, but it looks like they may need to have an operation for a stent or something. So Dorothy's daughter, let's remember. Velma Morford is having some continued health struggles, so let's remember Velma. And be aware, if she's not able to join us on Sunday, she's with us in spirit. And I know that she appreciates getting the, the DVD that Luann uh, generously shares with her. So she wanted us to say thank you, Luann, to you and others for that. Mona Bowie, Ott and Jackie Bowie's daughter-in-law, is in a battle with cancer. Want to continue to remember Mona. Rich Bressler was going to be here today and called me last evening, had a nice visit, but he got up and he's not feeling so well, so can't be with us, and let's keep Rich in our prayers. Laura Knapp, um, <coughs> excuse me, Becky Peters' sister-in-law, has been struggling with diabetes for quite some time and has had some real serious complications of that recently, lives in Niles, and, and uh, Becky is sharing that Laura and uh, her husband, Becky's brother, would like prayer. And a friend of, no, excuse me, Sue, this is your cousin, Glenn, right, you shared yesterday at Action in a Prayer Circle, but Sue Wilder's cousin, Glenn, is in critical condition after an aneurysm. And he's just not doing very well, so we want to keep Glenn in our prayers. Let's go to God in prayer. Holy God, during this season of thanks, above all, hear our gratitude. As your children who love and wish to serve, we also raise the concerns and the hurts and the struggles and the illness of our friends and family. Lord, be with those near and far and those in faraway places that experience war and famine and other forms of hunger and disease this holiday season. Keep clear in our hearts and our minds the call to respond to your love by loving others. We ask this in the name of our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, as we give us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us. Thine is a kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now is the time to return some of what we have been given. The music played during the offertory is count your blessings, name them one by one. The ushers will bring forward the offering during the doxology. <laughs>
Please stand for the doxology, praise God from whom all blessings flow, number 95. Giving God, our hands translate thanksgiving from the abundance of our lives to the practice of our faith. May we be blessed to know that these gifts serve your kingdom and bring healing to your people. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, who loves us whether or not we are lovely by the world's standards. Amen. Please remain standing for the closing hymn. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, number 139 in your hymnal. We'll be singing all five verses. done so, make sure you sign up for the directory photo. Go now in the knowledge and love of God, the Father Almighty, the grace of our crucified and risen Lord Jesus Christ, 
and the fellowship and power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.